Uh, this is Kyle Swicegood continuing our conversation with the World War II veterans and I'm representing the Rotary Club of Moxville and I am extremely honored uh, to have in my presence Harold Frank who is not only a World War II veteran but he is a POW uh, in Germany uh, for some time and he's going to share what I know is going to be a powerful story about war and peace. Harold, we've known each other a long time. Yes, sir. And uh, I think my dad would say very quickly that uh, we would call each other friends. Yep. Let's talk about what you were doing around 1940. What what was going on in, in Harold Frank's life in 1940? Well, before, I, the, before the war. I was uh, working on a little farm in Davidson County and going to Tyro High School. And uh, we raised cotton and wheat, sweet potatoes. And uh, when school first took up in the fall of the year, along about uh, last September, I guess, they'd let us out at dinner time, so we'd go home, pick cotton, and pick up sweet potatoes mm -hmm. to make a living. Mm -hmm. So one day you went to the mailbox, I guess, and you got a letter from Uncle Sam who... Well, uh, in 1941, when the Japs bombed Pearl Harbor, me and uh, a bunch of boys were playing tag football in the creek bottom up on the cow pasture. And when we got to the house, they it come over the radio. It was on a Sunday, February, December, and uh, they said they was telling about it over the radio. There wasn't no television yet then, and. Uh, uh, we said, well, I, was, I think I was 16 at that time. I said, it won't never bother me. It'll be over with before I, I get old enough to go. But I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, like you said, later on, I got a, a greetings from uh, President Roosevelt and the draft board together that uh, I was uh, come to the courthouse in Lexington, such and such a date, which is in May uh, of 43 to go to uh, Camp Croft to be examined to see what I passed for service. And that was in South Carolina? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't remember how many of us went down that day, but a lot of them didn't pass. And one boy I know that had his arm cut off right here, they sent him down there that day. Mm -hmm. And uh, the officer down there, the doctor, said, Son, what in the hell are you doing down here? He said, I got a notice to come. He said, Well, I'm going to give you the notice to go back. Mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, we can't use you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, we went through the line, got examined, and we was naked as jaybirds, and they had three sets of footprints on the floor. One for the Army, one for the Navy, and one for the Marines. And at that time, they was fighting like the devil in Guadalcanal. The Marines were. My daddy said, don't you get the Marines. And I wasn't too good a swimmer, so I decided on my own. I didn't want the Navy. Mm -hmm. And when I stepped up there, they said, I three guys in front of me failed. They didn't pass. And they said, well, what do you know? We got one here that passed. And I said, what did I pass for? He said, either one you want. And I said, well, I'm going to take the Army because I can't swim good. My daddy said, don't get the Marines. And I, I got to come back home for about two weeks, and then I had to go back to Fort Bragg, uh, not Fort Bragg, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And we got orientated there and, and got our clothes and things and, Caught a troop train to go to Camp Shelby, Mississippi. And we, uh, they organized a new division down there, the 69th Division, and uh, we was recruits for it. And we trained there at Camp Shelby, Mississippi, which was at Hattiesburg, Mississippi, right outside of Hattiesburg. Oh, all that summer till, till fall of the year, you might say. And uh, 
Actually, it was in the fall, wasn't it? They marched us down to Gulfport, Mississippi, to take amphibious training, which was 95 miles. We walked it in three days and slept in the woods at night. <laughs> and as soon as we got down there, we never did. Uh, they called out so many names, and everyone they called out was BAR men. And that's the Browning Automatic Rifle, 22 pound rifle. Uh, and they stood ball out to the side, and they brought a big truck up there and loaded us up and took us back to camp. Well, uh, we knew that wasn't good. We didn't know what was coming. But they uh, got us back to camp and gave us a, a Class A pass to go 50 miles. That's where you're supposed to go on a Class A pass. And I had a good buddy from uh, Temple, Georgia. And uh, we got to talk. I said, let's go to your house, which was four or 500 miles. <laughs> we caught the train up to his house. And he lived in a little bit of place about like Advance. Uh, at, uh, the railroad run along one side and the street beside of it and a line of stores on this side. And the train didn't even stop there, but the uh, conductor stopped and let us out. And uh, we stayed there, and we told the conductor on the train to pick us up on Sunday evening when he come back through going back to south. And he did. He stopped and picked us up, took us back. We got back, and he loaded us on the troop train the next day or two and uh, took us to Fort Meade, Maryland. And... Uh, we took a little more training there. We had to go in a, in a gas room where they had poison gas in there. And we had to go in there and put our gas mask on after we got in there. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't fool around too long of putting it on. <laughs> and uh, took a little more uh, practice with the rifles. And, uh, and then they sh shipped us out there. Camp Shanks, New York, and we stayed there a week or ten days, and they put us on a ship to go to Glasgow, Scotland, and we stayed in a uh, tent city out there in the boom docks for a month or six, eight weeks. I don't remember exactly how long. Anyhow, we went up, we, let, we went over in March of, of '44. And we stayed out there in that tent city till uh, they loaded us on the ship for the invasion of France. Yeah. So talk to us about uh, what was your participation? Uh, what was your participation in the invasion of uh, France? Well, I was a Browning automatic rifleman, and it was one in each squad, and uh, the rest of them had uh, either M1s rifles, semi-automatic. My rifle was fully automatic, and uh, I was, in other words, uh, firepower for that squad, 12-man squad, squeeze squad, three squads in a platoon, and uh, that, therefore there's three BAR men in that in that platoon. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so did you land on Normandy? Yes. And uh, what, uh, which beach were, did you land on? Utah Beach. You landed on Utah Beach. So, uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, boat delivered you to the shore? We went across the channel on the LST, and the LST is landing ship for tanks and infantry boats, and the LCI landed on the infantry. And uh, this LST was, oh, I expect. 300 feet long, something like that, and it had about eight, seven, eight tanks down the middle of it, and it had infantry on each side of it, three or four uh, columns. Uh, I don't know, probably a thousand infantrymen on there. Mm -hmm. And it went up and uh, dropped the whole front end, come down, mm -hmm. and we run, jumped out. Well, the first time it dropped it down, the water was too deep. I picked it back up and went on in further, dropped it down. When I jumped off, I was in water about 
oh, above my waist. And uh, I had uh, a 22 pound rifle and several hand grenades and and uh, 200 rounds of ammunition. And I had three men that carried ammunition for me, assistant gunner and, and two ammunition barrels. They carried, it was, it, Shot 30 oak sticks. That's what it shot in uh, 30 caliber. Let me ask you a silly question. Were you scared? Scared to death. Yeah. Uh, were you taking on? Were you taking fire as soon as you got off the? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you uh, walked in water up up to your waist, past your waist, and you climbed out and you got onto the beach, and you know we see movies. Did you just lay down and start shooting? Well, we run a piece and hit the ground, get up and run another piece and hit the ground. And uh, we was lucky it wasn't near as much fire where we went in as that as it was on Omaha Beach. Mm -hmm. Now, they caught the devil on Omaha Beach. We did too, but not nothing like it did on Omaha. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a lot, uh, a lot of casualties, but uh, a lot of us made it in. Harold, did you lose any friends? A lot of good friends. Mm -hmm. And I know that those are probably guys that you've taken uh, in your heart all of your life since that moment. Yeah. You carry with them to this day. Um, so once you got in, uh, now, was that beach, did it have a, a, a large cliff like, or was it? Uh, no, it was just more or less like it is down uh, the coast down here. It was a sand dunes. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, once we got over that seawall, you might say, it kind of leveled out just uh, like ordinary country. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, where we went in, there was uh, a lot of dairy and horses. I seen an awful lot of good horses and good cows get killed mm -hmm. along with the men. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of course, they couldn't couldn't get them up right then. It was June and hot, and uh, well, they they swelled up and busted, and we had to sit down beside them and eat and all that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> so, now, uh, if I understand it correctly, uh, you uh, you received a Purple Heart. Yes, sir. Uh, when did you get shot? I got shot the seventh of July. A 44. Mm -hmm. Tell us about getting shot. Okay. Uh, we were supposed to have got way inland further than what we was, but we run into a lot more opposition than they thought was there. And, and knowing that the terrain was, was bad to fight in, uh, the, the hedgerows, the fields over there, instead of having fence around them like we've got to have over here, they had rock piled up around and dirt on it and trees growing on and them germans were dug in in them places well on uh they sent 10 of us out on a reconnaissance patrol we was to go through the german lines and see what they had out there they was preparing to break out at st Lowe. Patton had come in and uh they was getting ready to make a big push to break out of Normandy where they could roll on across some open country. And uh, we got out there and, and uh, we come to this highway, uh, hard surface road, I'll put it that way, paved road. And we stayed there a little bit and watching. We see nothing and started across the road. And the Germans had a machine gun set up up there in the ambushes. And uh, four of us got across the road. I don't know exactly what happened to the other 10. They didn't get across the road. Some of them got killed there in the road. And uh, that, it was still dark then. And uh, we got back away from the road, and, and uh, they know we was in there. They hunted us all that day, and we shouted out with them until we run out of cottages, and, uh, and then they captured us. Uh, four of us. One guy was shot through the leg, and his leg was broke. And they killed him. And I shot this left shoulder. And 
This German soldier took me out in the woods away from the other two. And I don't know what he said. And he, he, he walked around in front of me and cocked his rifle. And he took it down, motion for me to go back out where the other two were at. And uh, they took us, I don't know, put good ways and walked us down the middle of a little old road and we had to walk with our hands up like this. And I shot in his shoulder and I couldn't hold this arm up and so I locked my hands over my head and walked like that. And uh, every once in a while the German soldiers would holler, handy ho, that meant get your hands up. Well, I, I, I couldn't get mine up. They took us back there and they, they put us in a horse stable. We hadn't had nothing to drink all day. Nothing to eat. It was after dark when they put us in there. And uh, they had a guard on the door. But it was a closed-in stable. We kept hearing something moving around that stable. And so we got the feeling around. So there was two big horses in there with us. <laughs> they was good. They didn't trump to death. But, uh, Were you bleeding real bad? Well, uh, some, yeah. Not not real bad, but it, it run down the back of my uh, fatigues. And, uh, How did the German soldiers treat you? Well, uh, the older ones that wasn't in the SS wasn't too bad. The young ones, like me, I was just 19 then, was mean as the devil. They was hard on us. They'd tell us something to do. We didn't speak German. They didn't speak English. And they'd tell us, and then they'd haul off and, and knock us upside the head or summers in the body with the rifle barrel or the butt of the rifle one. Next time I told something, we try to figure out what he said. Mm -hmm. And so, so you you would say that while you were a prisoner of war, <clears throat> you were assaulted by oh, these guys. Oh tenors. yeah, <clears throat> uh, that's something that that bothers me a sight. They're talking about a waterboarding these prisoners down at Guantanamo and torturing them, and they don't know what torture is. These people are saying that. They ought to have been with us. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How long were you a POW? Ten months and eight days. During that time, did you ever give up hope on your country? No. That, that's something you, you can't do. Don't never give up. Don't make no difference how bad it is or how bad things look. Don't give up. Because if you give up, that's it. Yeah, I, I had fellows with me, soldiers that were with me in that 10 months. All you thought about was something neat, something neat. And, and they got it in the head, we starving to death. And we were worse. But once they got it in the head, they were starving to death. They did, some of them starved to death. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that was the worst torture <clears throat> food. that they could do, I think. Uh, what kind of food did you were you given? Mostly potato soup and turnip soup. And once a month they'd give us, after we went out on work detail, got out of the prison camp out on work, we were still in prison, but it was on a work detail. Uh, we got fed a little bit better. Uh, we would install old 4B, and uh, everybody had dysentery, and wasn't getting fed, and living conditions were terrible. And uh, they come around one morning and morning, somebody volunteer for a, a work detail. Me and this boy from Kansas City, Missouri, were pretty good buddies. And uh, we volunteered to go out on it. They hauled us uh, overnight on a train to a place called Grossenheim, Germany, which is about 20 miles from Dresden, Germany. He ended up over in the Russian section of of Germany when they split it up. And uh, we worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week in a paper mill. I hauled pulp wood in and strapped paper in and, and reprocessing, grinding it up and making paper. 
but we had a little better living conditions and decent drinking water and a decent place to live. But I still ended up losing 90 pounds. You lost 90 pounds. Yeah. So when you... Uh, uh, that, I, I say 90 pounds because I weighed about 212 when I left England. And when I got back to uh, uh, Camp Lucky Strike in uh, France, they went, run us through and weighed us and all, and I weighed 117 pounds. And then the, I couldn't use this arm only down here. I, could use, I couldn't raise it up. That bullet was up underneath my shoulder blade. It was still in your shoulder. Yeah, it stayed in there the 7th of July to the 13th day of October. And they took me over to our little old first aid station, our little army hospital, a German hospital, and, and and cut it out of me. They mm -hmm. wanted me to work more. So it was it was taken out by the Germans? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I asked the German doctor if I could have it, and he'd give it to me. This is it right here. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, And I guess that's your dog tag. Yeah, my dog tag and my. Uh, I ended up getting a combat extra badge, <clears throat> which is the rifle with the wreath on it. I had it on my. I should have worn my cap up here, I reckon. But I think I got nine medals in all. And uh, got the POW medal and uh, combat extra badge. I never did get the Victory in Europe badge uh, medal. I don't know. I suppose I got it, but they didn't send it to me. Got a uh, Purple Heart. <clears throat> and uh, well, let me ask you a question about uh, how did how were you released from the camp? I mean, did some day the Americans come in and bust you out, or how did that happen? Well, about uh, <clears throat> about 17 days before before the war ended, the eighth day of, of May of '45. Uh, on a Saturday evening, they come in there and, and told us that we they was gonna move us out. That the Russians were coming and driving in there, and they didn't want the Russians to liberate us. Well, to tell you the truth, I didn't want the Russians to liberate me either. I done hear, hear too many bad tales about the Russians. And so about seven thirty, eight o'clock on Saturday evening, they moved us out, and the German civilians was moving out too out of that area, try to get away from the Russians. And they walked us from, from uh, Saturday evening, all night Saturday night, all day Sunday, all night Saturday Sunday night, all day Monday and Monday night, and Tuesday morning they stopped and fed us a little and gave us something to drink and, and let us rest a little. And uh, there was 107 of us out there, and I think it was 71 of them made, made it to the end of that march. The rest of them, when they fell out, I don't know what happened to them like that. Some of them got shot when they fell out. And some of them got dogs sick on them when they got, them German police dogs sick on them. And then last night I walked all night in my sleep. There was a, a civilian, German civilian behind me in a wagon and his old horse would, every time I'd get about there to pass out, that old horse would hoop me with his head, wake me up. I, I think a lot about it. Hell, I survived it and others didn't. Hell, I lived and others didn't. It, it bothers me. And still does. Why I didn't uh, go and others did. It uh, just wasn't my time. Harold, would would it be a pretty good assumption to say that there's not been a day in your life that you haven't lived uh, and relived what you went through in World War II? It hasn't been. I, I, I think about it every day. It don't keep me awake at night like it used to. Mm -hmm. But uh, ain't a day goes by, I don't think about it. Uh, and I'm telling you about it, they're telling us in German. What, I can talk German pretty good. Mm -hmm. I've, lo I've lost a lot of it over the years. See, it's been 64 years. and uh, But when I come home, uh, I could carry on a conversation like me and you is in German mm -hmm. if he didn't talk too fast. Mm -hmm. 
If he got in a hurry, I'd, I'd miss, mm -hmm. I couldn't cipher it that quick. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, after we got liberated and, and got back in the United States Army, General Eisenhower come out there and let us all send a call home, call our people. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we had to fill out all kind of papers. And one one place on them papers, they asked the question, did you escape while you was a prisoner of war? And me and this old boy from Missouri escaped, escaped down there close to Czechoslovakia and it was loose for five days at night and they caught us back, which wanted that and killed us, but they didn't. And uh, so I answered the question truthfully as I could. Uh, yeah, I escaped for five days. Well, lo and behold, long after I got home, got out of the hospital and got home and got discharged and got married, they passed some kind of ruin or law up in Washington that, that they was going to pay us ex prisoners of war a dollar a day for each day we spent in POW camp. Above our $60, $54 a month German Army pay. Mm -hmm. And uh, when mine come, they had a, and I got the letter, because some people don't believe it. They docked me them five days. They said I wasn't a prisoner them five days. <laughs> that was a, a fine example of bureaucracy not taking care of the foot soldier. That's right. And, and another thing that, that bothers me, later on, and you probably read it too, the, uh, them uh, Japanese Americans were they locked up out there and fed them good and had a bed to sleep in and all. Uh, they passed the law in Washington to give them $20,000 a piece. Mm -hmm. Okay, I spent better uh, about three years in the Army and only wrote 1800 some dollars for them three years. Don't understand that, do you? <laughs> yeah. It's hard. I know it is hard. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this because we have a, we have a, uh, we're going to kind of come to a close. Uh, this videotape is so that people, when you're passed away can hear a story from World War II and I'd like you to close by telling us what you would like to tell people after you're gone through this video about your experience in World War II. Go ahead. Well, like I said, I was drafted in there when I was a 19-year-old boy, or actually 18-year-old. And uh, when I turned 19, I was a prisoner of war. And when I Got to be 20 years old, I was a prisoner of war. Uh, and uh, if I had to, I would go back again. We got our faults in this country, but it's still the best country in the world. One thing that, that, that uh, bothers me, World War II was the last war we won. We won it. We whooped Germany and Japan at the same time, fighting under the flag of the United States of America. All right, the next war we got in was the Korean War, and we fought it under the uh, United Nations flag. They wouldn't let our boys win it. Mm -hmm. We ain't won nothing since. And we never will nothing, win nothing else as long as we're in the United Nations. Mm -hmm. I, I it, agree. It, uh, it taking. They don't want us to win. We still got time. And uh, World War II, everybody that was living had a, something to do with the war effort. They war. worked in the shipyard or welding yard or, or whatever. Everybody participated in winning the war. And ever since when we get in the war, one bunch pulls one way and one bunch pulls another, just like the politicians in Washington do. Uh, they ain't interested in the good of the country like people was in 1942 and three and four. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, I'm afraid that uh, if we got in another war, we wouldn't have the capacity to make our planes and tanks like we did then mm -hmm. to win the war. Mm -hmm. 
Well, Harold, <clears throat> let me say this, uh, and again, I've known you. I remember when I was uh, at my senior prom, you were a police officer uh, doing uh, protection work for the county of Davie. Yep. I remember that well. And uh, you're a hero. You are an honorable man. You served our country, and I appreciate your willingness to serve at a very young age and the fact that you were a POW and wounded in battle uh, even makes you a more special person and I appreciate you and uh, I appreciate you coming in and sharing what I know is still an open wound uh, in your life but uh, you are a uh, you're a good man and I'm proud to say that I know you thank you appreciate it you bet and we're going to end this conversation with Harold Frank, and uh, it's been a touching one to me. And uh, on behalf of the Rotary Club of Moxville, I'd like to thank you for uh, participating in this video. And uh, as I've ended every video, it's, I'm proud to be an American. <laughs>